You're listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Media. For more, visit our website at megiddoradio.com. That's megiddoradio.com. Good everybody. Welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 16th of September, 2017. Thank you all for tuning in. Tonight's program, we're going to be talking about Islam, kind of like the Islamic threat, but also talking in relation to issues about, say, what, what the Americans, what the Americans of this thing would re- recognize as the First Amendment to the Constitution, freedom, religious freedom, that concept, and comparing with the Bible, and that's what we should do as Christians, and this is primarily, we don't just deal with stuff that directly relates to the Bible. Sometimes we'll look at other issues and topics as well, but everything we believe must be tested against the Word of God and God's law. Now, I came across a statement that was made by the Free Church of Scotland continuing. A few people have, I think one or two people have messaged me about it. Now, sometimes I kind of like, there's a lot of different topics and... I'd love to cover more of them. Unfortunately, there seems to be different things that cop, prop up. A lot of stories that I think I'll be able to cover, I, unfortunately, I end up not being able to cover, especially in the Megiddo Review and things like that. So, please keep sending on stories and inf- any information on topics. Can't promise to cover everything, but I'll try and cover anything that might be related. Now, we're not going to just be talking about uh, this statement by the Free Church of Scotland continuing. Uh, it was about a mosque which is to be, which has been given the green light, basically, to build in Stornoway in Scotland. I'll get into that story in a second. We're also going to be dealing with a couple of other topics related to Islam. When I do a story, I like to, just the way I, I, I don't like jumping around one topic, another topic, because when I listen to podcasts like that, it's just, it's, I'm sorry, but it just sounds chaotic. M- most podcasts, Christian podcasts are like that. Unfortunately, you know, this one thing doesn't tie into another. And that's just the way I like to cover these things. So all everything we'll be covering today will be related to Islam and religious, so-called religious liberty and God's law. Now, straight away, because we're going to try and keep this show, actually going to try and keep this show as short as possible to about the hour mark, uh, because I'm kind of recording this is, um, I had to take my father-in-law and his wife to the airport So this morning. So I was a little bit tired, got home, and ended up sleeping for like two and a half hours after getting back from the airport. So I end, I'm ending up doing this show much later than I normally would. Been a bit busy, and uh, please, please keep me in your prayers. Uh, there's another topic I want to cover on Monday, not related to this, but on um, LGBT-related issues. So hopefully that can happen on Monday. Tiny bit behind on Megiddo TV by the time this program is on MegiddoRadio.com. Hopefully, I'll have show 274 on Megiddo TV. For those of you not aware, Megiddo TV is basically just the TV version of Megiddo Radio. If you want to be up to date with all the programs, iTunes is the best place to go. I'm not... The, t- the, the TV medium and everything like that is great. But, you know, YouTube could kick me off tomorrow for whatever reason. It's happened to other Christian channels before, so I don't depend on it. At the moment, on, U- on YouTube channels, like 421 videos, so it would be really sad if <laughs> that ever happened. And there's nearly 7,000 7, subscribers. But I'm also well aware that of YouTube's track record, and I, I'm going to try and actually put stuff probably on... Um, Oh, there's another, there's a couple other websites that are kind of similar, but unfortunately, YouTube has all the traffic, so that's the place to go. Getting to our first story that we're going to cover today, Mosque in Stornoway. This is a statement that was released by um, the Presbytery, this is the decision, Presbytery of the Outer Hebrides issued a press release in which they indicated their concerns relating to this development. Basically, the mosque being allowed to build. Uh, it says, uh, just the kind of a preamble to this statement, on the 31st of August, the Western Isles Council approved 
a planning application for the creation of a mosque in Stornoway. Now, they're concerned about this, and they have good reason to be. Uh, it really concerns me. It concerns me when Christians aren't concerned. That's I, I will get into that in a minute. But it gives you a good opportunity to look at the first commandment and why is you know why why I don't really get and I understand from years ago I was a libertarian before I was a Christian. Uh, years ago, okay, here's my transition. I was kind of like I suppose I was a lefty socialist for a while prior to being a Christian. Then again, this happened prior to being Christian. I became more and more libertarian. And got into, you know, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, the, you know, what was it, what do you call it? Oh, what do you call it? Austrian economics and things like that. But as time went on, some of the principles of libertarianism, one or two of them here, maybe Austrian economics, little bits of it, is compatible with the Bible. But I found that it just wasn't compatible. Libertarianism, complete, yeah, just do whatever you want. It's not biblical, okay? So eventually, I don't, I don't have a title anymore if it's biblical. Now, the Bible doesn't lay out every single thing we're supposed to do in government. However, the Ten Commandments is the moral law, it's the eternal law, and it's supposed to be applicable everywhere. In our homes, in our churches, and in the state. Romans 13 pl plainly lays out that uh, those who are in government... And it wouldn't even need, you know, like, it doesn't, there's nowhere where the, the moral law is not applicable. There's nowhere in life where we're allowed to say that another God is to be worshipped other than the true God of the Bible. Nowhere. It doesn't matter where you are. It cannot be acceptable. And government, those who are ministers of God, this is Romans 13, read Romans 13. This is New Testament as well. Not that. Does God say, well, you know, it's sometimes it's okay to worship other gods? Of course not. We would never say that. So, the doctrine, and this is pretty much what it is, of religious freedom. Unfortunately, a lot of Christian groups spend most of their time promoting complete religious freedom for all. Regardless of whether they blaspheme God, whether they honor Lord Jesus Christ or not. Where is the doctrine of complete religious liberty in the scriptures? It is not there. But what you will find is the first commandment. The first commandment which states, Thou shalt have no... Uh, um, this is in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no gods before me. First four commandments are related to our relationship to God. Commandments 5 through to 10... Our, our relationship to our fellow men. They go together. Okay? We are not being loving to our fellow men by violating the first table of the law. It seems that the only table of law that is applicable to the state now is the second table of the law for many Christians, unfortunately. Okay, they'll be against abortion. Why? Because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. But the Bible also says, you shall have no gods before me. See, this is the problem. It gets to the point, what else is going to be sacrificed at the altar of complete religious re liberty? Now, I do believe in respect for people and things like that. You show them respect. You, you Obviously, you share the gospel with them. But... And, and and as individuals. But you realize the false doctrine and you rely and you do not, for the sake of coming across as tolerant, violate God's law. That may not make us popular, but this is what the scriptures declare. We are to put God as number one. The true religion is to be promoted by the state in the land. So therefore... Patently obvious from the scriptures all the way through. Nothing changes between Old and New Testament in that sense. The, the dis dispensation changes in, certain, in terms of the administration of the covenant. That changes, of course. No longer sacrificing animals and things like that. No longer confined to the bounds of Israel. It goes beyond the borders of Israel. But other than that, God 
still demands the right to be... He is to be worshipped above all else, above any other false god. And Allah or anybody else is not to be worshipped. And the state is seeming they are ministers of God. They are to serve God. How are you supposed to know what is good and evil? The moral law. And clearly to approve and what they've done here in Scotland and Stornoway, they, uh, the Western Isles Council, are sinning against God by allowing this to go forth. Forget about, hey, in Saudi Arabia, we'd like to build churches. We wouldn't like if they did the same thing. No, no, no. What does the Bible say? Okay? Any of these kind of arguments, they're, it's using human reason and placing it above the Bible. It, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. What does the Word of God say? Okay? And how does it make any sense? The doctrine of complete, uncontrolled, religious liberty, should it apply to Satanists? Should it apply to those who teach that it's okay to kill people and all this kind of... Obviously, we have a line. But based on what? When do we draw the line? Do we use human reason, human logic to draw that line? Or do we use the word of God? And that is... This is where so we go so far wrong. And I know this is a bit of a preamble. That's where people go wrong. Uh, I'm reminded of the case of Ian Paisley. In government. I know this is probably not going to be popular to say. But he compromised. He compromised with Sinn Féin IRA. And basically, in that agreement... Temporarily, yes, there's, there's peace, and that's great. But do we say short-term peace? And it is short-term. And look, Northern Ireland is now a religious wasteland. I'm not saying because of that decision only. That, but it hasn't helped. So, to be pragmatic, nothing's really good come out of it. Of, co of course, it's great. The terrorism is reduced and things like that. But the decision to go into government with a group like Sinn Féin, with a, with a group that had blood on their hands. Not too long ago, Martin McGuinness, who was, the, who was in the IRA, he basically, like, you got these murderers who, who stop, you know, they kill all these people. Then they say, oh, I'm going to stop because why? Because it's political, politically advantageous in order to go into government because... You know, the gun isn't exactly as profitable as it used to be, whatever the case is. So they go into government, then because they stop killing people, by liberal logic, yeah, they're, they've saved many lives. That's wonderful logic. But who killed them in the first place? Well, unfortunately, Ian Paisley compromised in that area. Unfortunately, because of pragmatism, or what popular opinion is, that the land was given over. Are we going to... Sur you see, we, we've got some... T like, me, Lord willing, the, the opinion will be the same way. Lord willing, the people will love God and there will be no conflict. But to be honest, that doesn't really happen usually. It's usually, is it the will of the mob, or the people, and what they want at any one moment, or is it going to be the will of God? So... For an example, like so, something like Ian Paisley, yeah, it was great back in 1988 when he said, I denounce you as Christ's enemy. When he said, when he called him the Antichrist. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That was great. But when you see his, the end of his days and government is given over to murderers and, and it, is, it has been pretty awful for Northern Ireland. We, and I think it's a bit maybe different in the States, because I think he's seen in a better light in the States than he is here. It's, and I, like, I grew up in the South. He, the, the opinion of him is kind of different down South. They just, <laughs> they just don't like him anyway. 
And there's other reasons. I mean, some of his revivalism isn't great. And he's not exactly reformed, but I digress. The question comes, are we going to serve the will of God or the will of the people? We g there's going to be times we have to go against the people. They don't know this is wrong. It doesn't matter if all the people support abortion. All the people support the terrorist group. It doesn't make it right. And and here's the thing: this this man was a minute, excuse me, a minister of the gospel. Shouldn't have been in both positions. It's a conflict of interest. The state is supposed to, you know, uphold the law of the Lord, uphold the land, and it's not supposed to be, you know, the church is not supposed to be above the state, and the state's not supposed to be above the church. But they do keep each other in line. They are they are independent of each other. The state is, you know, it's got the sword and things like that. It looks after various things. And the church preaches the gospel. And if the state is sinning, then the church should preach against that. Okay? If it's neglecting its God-given mandate, Forget about the mandated people. What is this God-given mandate? And then the state's all supposed to keep the church in line, and the state is to promote true religion. And that's it's not supposed to be over the state, over the church, like a kind of an Episcopalian kind of uh, Church of England kind of setup. Okay? Now, so let's get to this release, and there was a bit of back and forth, and various different opinions on it. And unfortunately, a lot of people seem to side with, let's, it seemed to be that a lot of people were getting, you know, in the comments and underneath this post on Facebook, not that I, I don't like kind of going through people's posts on Facebook, you know, as in to create a show out of it, I kind of, it's a bit, I digress. But anyway, that they were siding with, well, let them build our mosque, let them do whatever, isn't it a great opportunity to preach the gospel? Would we ever use that logic with saying, hey, let them build a few brothels. We'll get, to, we'll get to witness to some prostitutes. No, no, we wouldn't. So why is it okay for, why, okay, we will pre, do share the gospel to these Muslims when you meet them, of course. But why is it something that we should say, yay, more opportunity to witness to Muslims? Do we... If you're if you've got a prison ministry, do you ever say, well, yay, there's more there's more people in prison. That's great. So you can share the gospel with the prison ministry. Would you ever use such logic? Sin is sin. This kind of sadly, look, this is sadly a very antinomian Calvinism today. It's not really Calvinism. I suppose is it new Calvinism? I don't know. It's antinomian. And there's so many different groups kind of pushing the line there. In their theory is very Calvinistic, and they, they teach well and things like that, and they're, they're very good at debating, you know, the different points about Arminianism and Calvinism, all this. But when it comes to living, it's just do whatever you want. And I, I talked about that. Are you a Calvinist in theory, but an Arminian in practice? And I, I, that, that is massively central today because... We we talk like pragmatists. We don't talk like reform people anymore. It should affect how we approach ministry and everything. Otherwise, it just becomes vain, puffing up, and we don't truly understand the doctrine at all. So, in this statement released by this presbytery, and just to let you know, Stornoway is in the northwest of Scotland. I realize people will be listening to this from various places around the world and will not have a clue where Stornoway is. It's on an island called the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides, which is where the Presbytery is, also known as Western Isles of Scotland. So it's like way up in the northwest. Looks pretty cold up there anyway. So I've never been there before, but we have had... We have some connections with churches in Scotland, and look, people haven't studied the history of the ch church in Scotland, how much has been a blessing, not just John Knox, I'm talking about others, and how strong the Presbyterian church has been for centuries, compared to other countries, not perfect, 
But compared to other countries, the blessing that the church in Scotland, not the church of Scotland necessarily by name, but some, you know, there's been some break offs and something at the Free Church of Scotland. Now the Free Church of Scotland continuing. The blessing it has been to the church. And it's often gone under the radar. I would, I would, you know, I would impress upon you to go study about the history of the church in Scotland, and I, I believe it will be a blessing to your soul. Now, this is a statement that they put out. This presbytery in the Free Church of Scotland continuing. Last Thursday, the Comarla, I think that's a Scots word, but anyway, granted planning permission. Oh, that's council. Yeah, I think that's Scots Gaelic. But anyway, I'm not too sure. Granted planning permission for the setting up of a mosque in the center of Stornoway. The Free Church of Scotland continuing presbytery of the Outer Hebrides uh, regards this as a most unwelcome development. Having made a pre representation on the matter of the council prior to the determination of the application, we now wish to state publicly the reasons why we object to the creation of a mosque in Stornoway. Praise the Lord! And how different is this to, ooh, I don't know, the a lot of other groups around the world? Now, we know people will bring up different settlements and different agreements that were reached and the foundations of various churches or whatever. It doesn't matter. Is the first commandment applicable in everywhere in life or is it just applicable in the church? And why is it? Does the, God's law bear in all of life or does it not? And if it, it becomes the thread that takes away everything, The statement says, our main concern is that the religion is with the religion of Islam itself. If a mosque ever, ever opens, Islam will be able to promote itself. Interesting how we talked about the inter interfaith dialogues there recently. Islam will be able to promote, promote itself in our midst through public worship. Despite its beliefs and practices of being alien to the religious convictions of the vast majority of the community. A slight nit. I, I would just say it's, it's irrelevant what the vast majority of the community. I would just say God's law states that first commandment, that's it. Now, I know it's that's not its main case, but I digress. Okay, Islam is wholly inconsistent with the teaching of the word of God and Holy Scripture. Praise the Lord that they mentioned that. Which is the only rule to direct us. Amen. It is opposed to the Christian religion as confessed by the church historically since apostolic times and is established by law in our land since the Reformation. Wow, is that refreshing to hear. They are taking a stand against this. Why? Because it is wholly at odds with the Word of God. That is the standard. And praise the Lord for the, the brethren who wrote this up. It's been published, published by Reverend, the Reverend David M. Blunt, but uh, it seems to be kind of um, a collective statement put out by the Presbytery of the Outer Hebrides. Fundamentally, the statement says, I'm not going to read all of this, uh, but they make some great points in here. Fundamentally, Islam utterly denies the divine person and the redeeming work of our blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to satisfy the justice of God, that he might grant forgiveness to sinners. <sighs> Isn't that what, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm sick of hearing people say, you know, with this, you know, the whole interfaith dialogue um, debate. Some people have claimed, or, well, one person in particular that I can think of off the top of my head, that, well, this is only an issue in the United States because, well, you know, people like political machines and all this kind of stuff, and people the rest of the world don't really care. Well, they do. And in the historic church, they did. And it's, well, even if it wasn't, it's still the word of God, but it's just really refreshing to hear people saying, why are we against this? We're against the propagation of a false religion. And we're not just going to say, hey, there's no power in their message. To say that a false religion does not pose a danger spiritually at uh, and does physically, but spiritually, just by that alone, that's, that is sufficient reason. Sufficient, completely sufficient. And it is a threat. It's a threat to your souls. It corrupts. False religion corrupts, regardless of what anybody may tell you. 
Now, I'm just going to read one. Now, this is the main point. When myself and Mark Fitzpatrick, we, we did a show, what, I don't know, 10 shows ago. But the whole Yester Cotty, James White thing. I'm going to be talking about that in a while. Because there's a little bit more information, new news on that. When we oppose that interfaith dialogue between Yasser Qadi, when Yasser Qadi was allowed to come before a group of people, it was a church building, come before a group of people, and it was allowed to preach his gospel. Now, I know he will say, well, you know, the gospel wasn't preached. Well, the, according to James White, he preached the gospel on the second night. My argument is, if you preach the gospel on the second night, by that standard, Yasser Qadi also preached his gospel on the first night. The ends do not justify the means. I know people will disagree with me who would be also against the interfaith dialogue. I don't, I don't think it's a... And I get what they're saying, but I think it's a weak argument. It could, it, 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 give them what they say. Actually, I think it makes it worse. Because they're actually helping to spread a false religion. But, but that's important, okay? That is the most important thing, and if there was nothing else, even if, just say, right, this was a, just say this was a rabbi whitewashing Judaism, you know, modern Judaism and, you know, the different forms of it and before people, and just teaching it, you know, because now it denies Christ. That would, ease, it, that would be wrong as well. Okay? It doesn't matter what false religion. Whether it was a Sikh or a Hindu. I, had a, I did a show on the Republican National Convention. Allowing a Sikh to pray there and all this kind of stuff. I did, I've done, done some programs on that. So I, I had a ma massive problem with that. Obviously because it's a false religion. And uh, that's a violation of 2 John verses 9 to 11. Now. On top of that. On top of that spiritual danger, which is clearly there, okay? A false spirit, a false prophet, you know, a spirit of Antichrist, etc. and so on. On top of that, and we should not become, well, we're just preaching the gospel, it doesn't matter, their message doesn't have any power, etc. and so on, it won't save anybody. Rather than that argument, rather than that, it's a very antinomian argument, okay? We... If, if, you know, if we love Christ, we will follow his commandments. One of his commandments talks about the preservation of life. Thou shalt not kill. That's not just not talking about you don't murder somebody. That's also talking about the preserve. There's a positive and negative pretty much all of the commandments. Okay? Here's what you don't do, but you, the, if you want more information on that, read Thomas Watson's amazing uh, book on the Ten Commandments published by Banner of Truth, you probably get a second hand. But in that, you know, he talks about, and other people as well when they're talking about it, the preservation of life. A violation of that commandment, thou shalt not kill, which is, sixth commandment, is it not? Yeah. yeah, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. It's not just that, it's a summarization of, the, of a commandment to preserve life. Now, the spiritual commandment is the most important, but also it does not diminish the preservation of life. By, prom by promoting the whitewashing or promoting the teachings of Islam, which calls for violent jihad. I mean, there's different stages of jihad, and I don't have time to get into all of it. Obviously, I know that the spiritual jihad, there's kind of struggles that people have, but also that is not divorced from the violent, revolutionary, whatever you want to call it, kind of jihad that most people know, but striking at people's heads and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, do not take the Jews and Christians for friends or they're friends of each other. The very anti-Semitic, anti-Christian, deception, subversion. It, this is all in the Quran and further even explained in the Hadith. Okay, this is, these are in the, I'm not going to go through it again today because I've done that in other shows. So go to megidaradio.com and type on the Islam, and I've gone through a lot of the, the, the verses in the Quran and some verses in the Hadith. Um, I've gone through the, just, you know, you don't have to 
like the the hadiths are huge. The hadiths are kind of sayings or supposed sayings anyway of the Prophet Muhammad. And they often come up maybe their collections. The most famous one is Sahih Bukhari, the Sahih Muslim. Basically, they are the, it's kind of a collection. Certain person, you know, Al Bukhari puts together this collection. I think it was about the ninth century. Bukhari's put together, and there was another one, and that's supposed to be the most recognizable, most authentic one. But they don't. They see that as kind of like a commentary, in the same way that the, you know, say Roman Catholics would see the Church Fathers, uh, in tradition and all that, in terms of interpreting the Bible and all this kind of thing. So that's, but the Quran is the main thing, and you can just get a lot of this. You can get in the Quran. Some parts of the Quran don't really make sense without being put in a certain context. However, the violent nature of the Quran, read, read uh, Surah 9, for example, is pretty clear. And I kind of worry for people one way or the other when they try to whitewash that and, and claim that anybody who doesn't want to whitewash that and wants to expose the physical danger to people's lives, etc. and so on, is therefore being Islamophobic. Okay, but here's what the statement says. Sorry, I'm kind of getting up on a couple of rabbit trails here, but I think it's really, really important to state it. But the, the press statement here, mosque and store in a way, you can go to freechurchofscotlandcontinuing.org to read all of this and just type in mosque in store in a way. Uh, it says, it is a sobering fact that in recent years, many militant Islamists or jihadists have entered European countries under the guise of being refugees and migrants. While the real intention has been to wage war on the West on behalf of their religion, we are witnessing the tragic results of this deception in the form of regular acts of carnage, including the UK. Amen and amen. We can't ignore that because, oh, just let them in. No, they're not all doing this. Hashtag not all Muslims, all this kind of stuff. Th that, by ignoring that and willfully just turning a blind eye and virtue signaling and say, oh, well, we believe in the gospel. We're just going to let them in and all. That is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. God is sovereign. We pray for the, that he will call out his elect by the, the effectual working of his spirit, the irresistible grace of his spirit. However, it isn't like we, we can just, you know, preach the gospel, but in a, in a disobedient way, which undermines the gospel. Because that says to the person, this, it, it sends the message of, you know what? Yes, we want to get you in heaven, but we couldn't really, you know, we don't really care too much about what God's law really says. Is God going to bless that? Do you re even from a kind of, if you want to kind of argue from a pragmatic point of view, will God bless that? Do you think God is exalted when he's, when his law is ignored like that? So it, to just flagrantly disregard it and, you know, be just, I just open the boards, doesn't really matter. The state is being horrible and racist and all this kind of stuff in order to stop Muslims from coming into the country and all this, the travel, uh, so-called travel ban by Trump and all this kind of stuff. But it's a violation of the Sixth Commandment. We're supposed to preserve life and what they believe. I mean, come on. If you believe somebody wanted you dead, you know, just say in another context, somebody wanted you dead, somebody was a potential danger to your children, do you invite them into your home? Or do you protect them? Do you, if you think that somebody is a danger to your child's safety, do you stick, I hope the answer is no, that you, will you put your children into a, a school where somebody is a potential danger to your child? I hope the answer is no, and who knows nowadays. But do you know what I'm saying here? But the preservation of life, yes, the spiritual aspect and somebody's eternal soul is the most important. But we're supposed to obey all of the law. And to show love to our neighbor, we're all supposed to share the gospel with them. You want to reach those Muslims in foreign lands? Great, send missionaries. Okay? But to flagrantly disregard, you say public safety, whatever you want to call it, that's not Christianity. Anyway, and I say this in the context, there's a lot of antinomianism. And say, well, 
don't you believe that the perseverance of the saints? And all, look, if you go down that route, you're going to end up with some kind of a form of hyper-Calvinism. Using that kind of logic. A distorted Calvinism. A Calvinism that is really divorced from the Bible and really doesn't have much to do with it. It would be like a blend between human logic and Calvin. Calvinism is, a, is something that came out of the scriptures. It started with the scriptures. We're not supposed to start there and then extrapolate using human logic or faulty human logic. So you can read that on the Free Church of Scotland's uh, website, freechurchofscotlandcontinuing.org, and I, and I praise the Lord for them taking that stand and saying unpopular things, and I pray that the Lord will bless their ministries, the preaching of the gospel, and their congregations, and their work. Now, on to the next story. Memphis Imam raises money for Islamic Charity, U, uh, Charity U.S. Congress says has ties to Muslim Brotherhood. Now, this is talking about Yasser Qadi. Now, I said I wasn't going to... I... That I was only going to talk about this if there's new information. This is new information, okay? So, it has been claimed that this is just recycling information and all this kind of stuff. It, it's not. This is related to a story that was put out by the Washington Free Beacon, which, and this is back in August 28th of last month, Congress seeks to cut USA to Islamic charity tied to terror. Okay. This story, this is in the Washington Free Beacon. A new congressional measure seeks to cut all U.S. funding for an Islamic charity that has been banned in some countries for providing assistance to Hamas and other terror-tied organizations, including the Muslim Brotherhood, the, Free, the Washington Free Beacon has learned. And anyway, it talks about that. So, in the context of that information coming out, this, the, the Tennessee Star, okay, it appears we're having some technical difficulties, just one moment, and I am going to change the video, two seconds. Okay, we're back. Yeah, that was kind of strange. The video kind of stopped recording there. So, that has never happened before on that camera. We pray that it will not happen again. Um, okay, last week, Representative Ron DeSantis, this is reported in the TennesseeStar.com. Rob DeSantis, a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, introduced an amendment to the State and Foreign Operations uh Appropriations Act blocking any U.S. funding to Islamic relief worldwide. Between 2015 and 2016, IRW, which is the Islamic Relief Worldwide, received $370,000 in federal funding. Now, DeSantis explained to the, the Free Beacon that. Anyway, so, so just to clear up that, it has been claimed, unfortunately... And this was kind of repeated on his program. This is I'm referring to James White. James White, when he was sent the retread of this story in the Tennessee Star, Robert Spencer. Robert Spencer covers any of these stories, and he'll share them. And he he gave a bit of a background to the story and why Asarkadi and how that is important and things like that. Now. He said, expect Robert Spencer to recycle the story about once every three to four months. That's the cycle these folks use, I've, as I've discovered. So he's saying, well, this is just, you know, re rehashed. On his program, then, he dealt with the, the, the opening part. And if you just listen to that program, you think, well, that's all. It's just kind of repeating the same thing. And there's nothing new here. Uh, there is, this is news, and this is um, this is a new story, so it's not. So, 
again, because of it was Ron DeSantis last week, a uh, member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Basically, this has come out. Now, these are federal investigations. Things have come out over various times. So what does it say here? So they're trying to block any funding. It shouldn't be, uh, there shouldn't be really any funding for these groups. But any funding to any group that is tied to Hamas, I suppose start off there, <laughs> that would be a good place to start, or the Muslim Brotherhood should be ineligible for funding. So, um, it says, between 2012-2016, Memphis Imam Yasser Qadi has helped IRUSA raise money, so this is over a long period of time, raise money speaking at a dozen fundraising events. This is in the Tennessee Star, by the way. More recently, he, he undertook an eight-day tour in the UK to raise money for the parent organization. I'll just see if I can get that. How recently that, that, that was reported in the Daily Mail. Yeah, this is, this is actually news pretty recently. This is like April 2017. This is in the Daily Mail in the UK. It talks about British Islamic charity involve, invites hardline Muslim, quote, hate preacher, unquote, who said killing of gays and stony adulterers is part of Islam, is to speak on its fundraising tour. Some of the points that they make, I'm not going to read all this article, but it says Dr. Yasser Qadi will speak across Britain to raise money for, for charity Islamic relief. He um, called rise of gay rights regressive and praised Islamic punishments. Of course, this parts, you know, obviously we are against the rise of homosexuality as well. U.S. academic also called the Holocaust a hoax, but later called that a mistake. Um, yeah, he claimed that, but uh, there's reason to doubt that, okay? Why? Because the Quran, the Hadith, and all this kind of stuff is anti-Semitic. So, um, anyway, he said that's a mistake. And, you know, there is Takiyah. Is he using Takiyah? We don't know. Okay, can we be honest here? We don't know. But should we take everything he says as face value? Or should we have a little bit of um, pause and say... Maybe it's not consistent to what he says he believes, which is the Quran and the Hadith. Now, so anyway, that was covered. This is Islamic Relief UK. So he spoke there not too long ago, and that's reported in the Daily Mail. Now, um, it says here, British Brit Britain's Charity Commission, which regulates nonprofits, requests. IRW's decision to feature question IRW's decision to feature Qadi, described by the Times as a hardline Muslim preacher who has recorded apparently telling students that killing homosexuals and stoning adulterers was part of their religion. So anyway, there's there's other information as well. Um so this is all in relation to DeSantis's amendments to block the funding to this group that is connected to Hamas. Uh, the Tennessee Star, I mean, look, if that can't be reported, why can't it be reported? Nothing would ever be reported again. Okay? This is a further development to the same, to the same, well, it's not the same, it's not, re, is it related to the, this, the talks last January in the Interfaith Dialogue? Yeah, because White has, legitimized him before a Christian audience and this guy is connected to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, there's no two ways about it. Um, IRW, which is the group that he has raised money for, Qadi has helped raise money for, was banned by, was banned in Israel after government report determined that the charity provided material support to, quote, Hamas infrastructure, unquote. Get beyond another bit. In 2012, Swiss bank USB closed IRW accounts, and four years later, HSBC severed its ties to IRW. This is the group in question here, out of concern for that funds raised and transferred to by our IRW were helping to fund helping to fund terrorism. In 2014, IRW was banned from operating in Israel. While wow, this is really amazing, while the United Arab Emirates. 
blacklisted IRW. The Muslim Brotherhood Care, also based on ties to terrorism. Now, Yasser Qadi has also spoken for Care at a, quite a number of times. And it has been said by some that Care is Hamas, that these are various, various front groups. Tennessee Star goes on to state that Care is a name is a named unindicted co-conspirator in the largest U.S. terrorism financing prosecution related to the Homeland Foundation for Relief and Development, which was the largest Islamic charity in the United States, until five of its officers were sent to prison for funneling $12 million to Hamas. CARE's efforts have its unindicted co-conspirator... CARE's efforts to have its unindicted co-conspirator status removed in federal court only served to affirm, reaffirm the evidence in court supported CARE's ties to Hamas. And quoting from that case, then the government has produced ample evidence to establish the associations of CARE, ISNA, the, the Islamic Society of North America, and also uh, Hadi was there recently. That was, we covered that before in the program. Linda Sarsour was there. ISNA, NAI, and NAIT, and HLF, which is the Homeland Foundation, the Islamic Association for Palestine, and with Hamas. So there's plenty of evidence that support associations and close links. So group after group after group, anybody who has any sort of knowledge in this area, anybody, they all say, People like James White and guys like that, well, it's really only James White that I can see is making his case. Well, he distanced himself. He doesn't believe that the Holocaust is a hoax anymore. That's a mistake. That was in my, my younger times. Okay, is it possible that he, he's dis, that that's, he doesn't believe that anymore? It, it's possible. However, when you still spend time around groups that are linked to terrorism and these views and other things like that, I think people have good reason to question the the consistency of what he's saying. For example, look in so-called quote-unquote Christian circles, Stephen Anderson, giving an example, Stephen Anderson who denies the Holocaust. Ridiculous. False. He's a false teacher. He's a false prophet, if you ask me. Okay, teaches a false gospel preaches against repentance. Anybody who preaches repentance, he puts them on a blacklist. Uh, plenty of people know who Stephen Anderson is. So, he denies the Holocaust. If I have a problem with, just say, 10 years ago, I denied the Holocaust. Just say if I did that. And then, five years later, I say, no, that was a mistake. That was wrong. But then, I spend time with Stephen Anderson, and I spend time raising money with him. I spend time in the same groups, the same anti-Semitic groups, the same groups who believe throwing homosexuals off buildings and all this kind of stuff. Do you think it might make you th question whether you re truly renounce those views? When we, you know, in, in Christian circles, when we talk about repentance... If, if somebody says to you, I've repented of adultery, but you still find the same behavior, have they truly repented? If they're, what they say with their mouth is inconsistent with what you see, is it truly legitimate? Should we believe that? Should we really be naive? I hope the answer you could say is no. Now, Do, okay, the spiritual aspect of it by itself is serious enough. The false religion, that's enough to oppose this. To oppose the building of the mosque in Stornoway. To oppose the interfaith dialogue between Yasser Qadi and allow him to preach his false gospel. Okay, and you say, oh no, he didn't preach the gospel. Well, then James White didn't preach his gospel either. So you can't have it both ways. And I've, I've talked about that plenty in the programs before. But also, with that, there's the danger to human life. Danger to people's safety. 
recently, and this is one of the tragic events of this, okay, there's been a massive influx of Muslims, mainly Muslims, so-called refugees, most of them are economic migrants from what I can see, but refugees into various countries like Germany. 2015, there's been like 1.1 million in 2015 alone. I don't know how many people have gone to Sweden over the years. Sweden has been completely changed. And it's been this virtue signaling approach, this kind of smog. We're, we're going to, you know, ignore public safety. And we're going to be the, you know, the nice people of the world kind of thing and see where it's got them. There's a rape epidemic in Sweden that the police cannot deal with. That's why I praise the Lord for the, the presbytery in the Outer Hebrides having the guts to say that it's a sobering fact that in recent years, many militant Islamists and jihadists have entered into European countries under the guise of being refugees and migrants. I praise the Lord that they have the guts to say that. That is, and it's patently obvious from the news and, and from any, plenty of evidence for that. Back in July, 2000, this is, this is a, an article written by Paul, Paul Joseph Watson in InfoWars, but he's linking to a story um, of a Swedish journalist who rings the police. The journalist's name is Joachim Lamott. I think I'm pronouncing his name okay. Um, so he's, this journalist who's covering a story of a 12-year-old girl who was dragged into a restroom by an older man in the center of Stenuns, Stenunsund, Stenunsund, S-T-N-U-N-G-S-U-N-D, been, you know, dragged into a restroom before being beaten, raped, and threatened with death. Later, was it one month later, he rings the police, wondering if any investigation has been done on it. He records this is on YouTube. Now, it's in Swedish, so I have to kind of trust the translation process, and hopefully everything was done okay. But he, this Swedish journalist, contacted authorities and was told that the police, quote, could not cope with the workload of having so many rape cases. I'm going to read you some of the conversation. There's no point in me playing it on the show because it's all in Swedish, but this is the English translation provided for it. Do you know how many rapes we have? Lamont was told by police official in a conversation he recorded and uploaded to YouTube. He said, this is the, uh, the Swedish journalist. No, I don't. But I talked to the mother and her, and her daughter feels very bad because of this. And I don't know who this man is. And I know, sorry, I know who this man is. I have his address, his name, address, social security number and everything. And I mean, you haven't even in interrogated him yet. Isn't that remarkable? Well, you might think so, but we have so many similar issues. And so few people available. We cannot cope with the workload. This is the, the police officer. That sounds unbelievable. A 12-year-old girl who is raped? It's just a child, the reporter said. We have three-year-old children that get raped. Responded the police officer, sounding clearly exasperated. So, Paul Joseph Watson also... This is Sweden now. And they're burying it because it's, it's seen as racist and Islamophobic to cover this kind of thing. Um, since 2012, sex crimes in the country have doubled. And it's also been... It's very hard to get statistics, but... One... Some statistics show about... It's 5.5 times more likely... Um, that immigrants are 5.5 five times, five, 5 5 times more likely to carry out sexual assaults... And also, there's, you know, there's sexual assaults or soaring. Um, if you go to Swedish music festivals, you're crazy. You should never do it, especially if you're a woman. Over 150 assaults and 20 rapes being reported this summer alone. So, it's chaos. And that's what they get for... Can we, can we get away from the strawman arguments of, well, they don't believe in the gospel. Well, just because we believe in the gospel and the power of God into salvation doesn't mean we endanger the, the public safety 
actually should mean we shouldn't. We should value the, God's law even more. That we endanger the public safety of our family, or women, children, and of our fellow countrymen. Okay, we have a responsibility to those in our, in our our neighbors to love thy neighbor as thyself, as we have to other people. Uh, I wasn't sure if I get onto the story, but uh, Christian today, I think I don't know if this is like Christianity today, but Christian today, I think it's ChristianToday dot com. Had a, a, a story called Christian worshippers at Green Belt can learn Islamic worship chants. They bring over the, basically the story is this this festival, which is apparently Christian, invite over a you know somebody to teach them kind of an Islamic chant. So it says Christian worshippers at this year's Green Belt festival will have the opportunity to learn Islamic worship chants, thanks to an organization which says its primary aim is to guide seekers of Allah. Quote, guide seekers of Allah. The Ansari Qadiri Rifai Tariqa, which describes itself as an international nonprofit organization. So basically, it's promoting that. This Christian festival is allowing to come over. You can, again, the story is called Christian Worshippers at Green Belt, G-R-E-E Belt, um, uh, this is in UK, by the way, um, can learn Islamic worship chants. And it's amazing. Here, Here's some of the justification for this, okay? So, Greenbelt's creative director, Paul Northup, Northup Paul Christian today, being, being able to introduce this new venue and programs feeds into Greenbelt's commitment to help build better religious literacy. And it is a continuation of Greenbelt's programming about Muslim faith at previous festivals. We want to play our part in dismantling the extremist stereotype and narrative the Muslim faith and community have labored under and to provide space of welcome and conversation. Hmm. Where does that sound familiar? Place of welcome and conversation. Hmm. Well, I digress. Anyway, he added, in a world that could even entertain the idea of a Muslim travel ban, freedom of movement being curtailed based on religious identity, where identity politics more generally seem to trump all, it's important for us to take, make room to bring people of different faiths and understandings together and to respectfully allow them to demonstrate how they worship. And now, this is another thing. Pay attention to what he says here and how it seems to be so similar to the justifications offered in defense of interfaith dialogue. It is because we are Christian that we do this. Not because we want to dilute or deny our faith, but because we want to be true to our faith and continue to live and express it dynamically, creatively, and generously in a world which seems ever more divided than we want to bring build bridges, not barriers. And I remember during that conversation, dialogue, whatever you want to call it, between Yasser Qadi and James White back in back last January, it was talking about, well, we're, we're, we're in a more secular world, we need to come side by side and need to extend the helping hand. In a world, this is what this guy says at this Christian, quote-unquote Christian festival, in a world that seems ever divided, that we want to build bridges, not barriers. Well, according to this logic, we shouldn't really say anything about this. Well, you know, they're just learning. How else are they supposed to know? I mean, Qadi taught about the Shahada, you know. And he also offered, seemed to be like prayers to, he was like, what is, what is prayer? Speaking to God. And he was, you know, he was saying, you know, praise to Allah and all this kind of stuff at the, at the beginning of the second talk. Should we have, if we, we say, no, no, everything's good there, well, well, what's wrong with learning about Islamic chants? It's not like we're worse. It's not like it's any danger to the church, is it not? Oh, there's no, no danger, no, nothing to see here. So um, can anybody see how that's going to weaken our witness to Muslims? If we take this stance, which a lot of Christians seem, this antinomian stance, in order to be, don't call me Islamophobic approach, it's going to weaken our stance towards Muslims, and I think it's going to have a massive imp impact, much like 
the ECT document. Is ECT the same as the Interfaith Dialogue? No. And I never said that, even though one or two people claim that. Um, what I, my point was that it's like the precursor to evangelicals and Catholics together. Precursor, not the actual signing of the document. Because in the signing of the document, they went a step further and actually, well, in no uncertain terms, more in a greater extent, weakened the proclamation of the gospel. Okay. Now, Lord willing, we'll return Monday to talk about issues kind of still relating to, say, religious liberty and all this kind of stuff. In America, you've got a choice, okay? And, and it's the same in the, in the UK and Ireland. Are we going to promote the Word of God, the law of God, or are we going to promote religious, complete, unhindered, for any religion, religious liberty? Are we going to say, it's like saying Elijah, should El was Elijah wrong with the prophets of Baal? Should he have said, no, 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 you know, this is not tolerant and nice. The it's either the First Amendment or the First Commandment. Which will we stand on? Are we going to stand on human reason? Human logic? Faulty human reason and human logic? Will we stand for the First Commandment? Will we stand for the preservation of life? Not just in the womb. We should, of course we should do that. Preservation of life, but the preservation of life of our neighbors. Are we going to bring in individuals into our midst, trusting them, promoting them, giving them a platform, not just to preach their false gospel, but also to bring in a potential danger to our neighbor, to our families? Will we allow that? Will we allow that because we want to seem nice? Will we just virtue signal our way into explaining this? Brethren, if you're confused about all this, pray about it, but realize that the word of God, the law of God is extremely clear in us. We are not to give a platform to false religion, and we are not to give a platform to allow it to achieve its ends and its goals. So in Paul Flynn, Talk to you again next Monday.